Eh, estoy feliz de presentar nuestra información sobre Eto Fersen. Yo hablo un poquito de español, pero no mucho. Y no puedo presentar este tema en su hermosa lengua. Um, muchas gracias por uh, la invitación. So I'm going to be presenting today on the uh, gene-targeted therapeutics for ALS and focusing on tofersin and SOD1 antisense oligonucleotide. Um, I always start with disclosures, in particular to longstanding um, collaborations with industry, Ionis Pharmaceuticals, with whom I've had the pleasure of um, developing antisense oligonucleotides, and the ASO that I'll discuss today was developed with Ionis. And also uh, Biogen, with whom I've had the pleasure of running clinical studies, and the study that I will discuss today, the study sponsor, is Biogen. We talk about uh, genetic-focused uh, therapies. Uh, I'm going to focus on antisense oligonucleotides targeting RNA. We also could use siRNA to lower levels of RNA or gene editing. Uh, CRISPR uh, has been uh, discussed Antibody or small molecule approaches also could achieve similar targeted approach. And for more in-depth presentation of genetic focused therapies, I um, invite you to look at the uh, presentation on the Northeast ALS Consortium website, uh, which is neils.org. Okay. As many of you know, the, the genetic landscape of ALS, most ALS is non-genetic. It's unknown uh, what the cause is. There may be some uh, genetic components, but not one gene that defines that ALS or a gene that runs in the family. Among the 10%, about 10% that is familial, SOD1 is, um, is about uh, 4% of that. And uh, so SOD1 is one to 2% of overall ALS or 10% of the familial in this category of um, expanding out here, SOD1. And CNR72 represents uh, 50 to 60% of, of the genetic form. We're going to talk about SOD1 ALS. Again, causes 1% to 2% of ALS overall. SOD1 stands for superoxide dismutase 1. And it's a genetic change, one letter that is changed in the genetic code. And this genetic change leads to toxicity to the neurons from an abnormal protein that's produced. And I'll describe a little bit more of that. To understand um, genetic therapies and, and, and uh, genetic um, causes of ALS, you understand DNA, RNA, and protein. And one way to describe, describe this is to think about um, so a, an analogy to building a house or maintaining a house. And so the DNA really is the blueprint for how to, to make a, a house, for example. It's a instructions or code uh, that tells us how to do that. And um, again, this is written down in a book set of instructions, but it's a complicated set of instructions and it needs to be rewritten, for example, in sub manuals or ways to, to create a living room. And that would be the RNA, which would be a, a smaller set of instructions. You can think of the proteins as the stuff that would be in a room, for example, a living room, a chair, or a rug, uh, uh, for example, or um, something like a brick that, that helps to hold up the walls. These would be the, the things that help to hold up a house. These are the proteins that you see within a cell. And when there's an abnormal gene, there's a change in the genetic code, a mistake in that uh, blueprint, it leads to a change in the RNA and a change in the protein. And so now something that was beautifully folded before now becomes misfolded and toxic or so abnormal or toxic protein. And that's just uh, uh, shown here where there's a, again, this DNA genetic code rewritten into the RNA, which then is written into uh, something like um, a brick. But if there's a problem with that brick, a, a mutation, a change, you get what might be an abnormal shaped a uh, brick, something that does not fit as well uh, into the house. And then again, if you're thinking about the, the house sort of analogy, um, in the beginning, it's it's fine um, that that brick doesn't have a problem, but over time with some extra wear and tear on the human body or on a house here, you see that the house falls apart or that the human body, the motor neurons themselves degenerate. And that's the way that I think about DNA, RNA, and protein that helps understand our genetic therapies. So again, we have an abnormal gene, 
a change in the genetic code. And that um, leads to a problem with the RNA. And then we can use an antisense oligonucleotide. You can think about this as a small eraser of sorts, deleting this RNA, removing the RNA. And therefore, if you delete the RNA, then you remove this toxic protein. And we think that that's going to have beneficial effects. I want to share with you now some of the recent uh, uh, data from the SOD1 antisense oligonucleotide trial. Um, these data were published in July, sorry, in September of this year. So um, about a month ago in terms of the, the time that I'm giving this presentation. <clears throat> there were many people involved in, in this study, many groups involved in, uh, in this study. Um, so the authors are listed here, as well as recognizing the Valor and Open Label Extension uh, a group working group. Valor was the name of this trial for antisense oligonucleotide <clears throat> named Tofersen for SOD1 ALS. There were um, 72 uh, people on drug, 36 on placebo. This is showing you the times when they were given the doses. So three within the first month, <clears throat> and then another five doses given approximately one month after that. And then there was a follow-up period. It says here 48 weeks of the, the parent trial, but then many people were converted into the open label extension. Some of the overview, the antisense uh, molecule named tofersen tested intrathecally. I should have mentioned that it, this is delivered into the cerebral spinal fluid. This is the fluid that bathes brain and spinal cord. The delivery is uh, through the back uh, as would be done with a lumbar puncture. So that's the way the drug is delivered. And then once it gets into the cerebral spinal fluid, then distributes throughout the brain and the spinal cord. Um, I will mention that in a, in a subgroup of the faster progressing disease, there was no clinical difference. This was our primary readout at 28 weeks. But at the longer time points, as I'm going to show you, there was some stabilization of function. Okay, going, going through these results, in each of these next couple of um, uh, uh, slides, you'll see in blue is the group on uh, placebo, and in uh, red... Here is a group that was treated with tofersen initially. This bar in the middle at 28 weeks is the open label extension. Open label extension refers to the time when everyone had the ability to go on drug. So at 28 weeks, all were invited to, to go on the active compound. 88% um, of the people in the study decided to participate in this open label extension. And then we followed people out here to the 52-week time point. And the first thing that you can see is we're measuring the amount of SOD1, superoxide dismutase 1, that's what we're targeting, measured that in the cerebral spinal fluid. And you can see by 12 weeks that the SOD1 is um, reduced and it stays down. This is a good sign. It says that the drug is doing what it's supposed to do. It was designed to, to lower SOD1. Indeed, it does lower SOD1. The next is looking at neurofilament. Neurofilament is one of the structural proteins that is in the long processes associated with axons of, of the motor neurons. So these nerve cells reach from the back, go out into the periphery, and then uh, go into the muscles. And when those nerves degenerate, they release this protein. Um, which is called neurofilament into the blood and also into the cerebral spinal fluid, the fluid that bathes the brain and spinal cord. It's nonspecific. It goes up in a number of different diseases where there's damage uh, to neurons. Um, so it increased, but it increases in the setting of ALS. It increases again in multiple other neurodegenerative diseases. It's associated with neurodegeneration. In this study, we saw that neurofilament came down and stayed down. And then in this group here, they were initially on placebo. They got drug at this point here. And then you see in this group too, that the neurofilament levels are lowered. Our interpretation of these data is that we've substantially slowed down the neurodegenerative disease process. Okay, so what happens clinically? So we're looking here at the ALS functional rating scale. 
So this is a 48 point scale. You start with 48 points and lose points on this scale as you lose function as measured in four different uh, domains, which would be um, fine motor, for example, use of your hands, gross motor, for example, use of um, for walking or uh, uh, turning over in bed, breathing function, and then also um, function uh, in and around the, the face, um, swallowing movement of the face, for example. So that declines over time, and we use that as an ALS functional rating scale. And you can see at 28 weeks, there is some difference. The group on red that were treated doing a little better than the group on placebo. But if you look out here in the open label extension, this is when you begin to see more of an effect of stabilization of function, which is uncommon, as many of or all of you know, in the setting of ALS. So some stabilization of function in the later time points. If you look at breathing, you see the same story. That this is the slow vital capacity, a measure of breathing. Again, some difference at 28 weeks. When you look out further, you see a stabilization of function. Um, now you see that stabilization of function in both of the groups, especially here. This next is my favorite slide. So this is showing the handheld dynamometry mega score, which is a fancy way of summing up the strength of a number of different muscles. And we're using a, a digital readout for how much strength is in that particular muscle and comparing it to where it was when it started. And what you can see is, again, stabilization that I've, that I've been talking about. And I think you can see in the group that was originally on tofersin. So they've been on the drug for, for a year now that there may be some improvement. These are, um, we should be cautious about this interpretation with relatively low numbers and some variability, but we begin to see an increase in strength uh, uh, in this group that was originally treated with uh, tofersin. And, and, and again, I'm uh, quite struck by this, in that uh, stabilization, unusual in the setting of ALS, improvements or increases in strength um, strikingly unusual in, in the setting of ALS. So we consider this a very good sign uh, that the drug is doing what it's supposed to do. Any discussion of this type of drug uh, needs to be accompanied by some comment of adverse events. We record in a clinical trial each and everything that happens to everybody in the trial. And what you can see in terms of the adverse events is that the vast majority had something that happened in the setting of the trial, we also record normal progression of ALS. And so a number of these you know, come up with adverse events, but most of the adverse events that we recorded in this study were related to the lumbar puncture. I mentioned this is intrathecal delivery, the drug that goes into the, uh, through the back as, it, as with a lumbar puncture. And that uh, led to some uh, mild uh, adverse events in a number of different participants. There were um, other adverse events as is shown here. And in fact, uh, though not, not detailed as well uh, in here, there were some serious neurologic events uh, related to the nervous system. So again, this, um, this is a powerful medication. It does have some uh, adverse events. So some conclusions. Uh, the, this drug, tofersin, that targets SOD1, does indeed target SOD1. We lower the levels of SOD1, mRNA, and, and protein. The reduction in the neurofilament in the plasma, to me, suggests a marked slowing, a um, substantial slowing of the neurodegenerative disease process. At 28 weeks, this was not as easy to see, though there are differences. The primary endpoint for this study was not met at 28 weeks. But when you look longer, you do see slowing of the clinical decline in the, in, in the uh, later time points, and perhaps some increases in strength in the, um, in the later time points, especially in those that were initially on drug. I already mentioned that there were some serious adverse events. I, I do wanna comment on some of the implications for non-genetic ALS. Many of you listening will be reflecting on this story and say, well, that's great if you have an SOD1 mutation, but what about the rest of ALS? What, what do we learn from this? A couple of thoughts. 
first is that um, neurofilament. Neurofilament was lowered in the study in a substantial way, and I interpret that as slowing down of neurodegenerative disease. I think we now know that we can use neurofilament to see um, whether a drug is having this kind of an effect on the neurodegenerative disease process. It's a um, very good news for using neurofilament as a biomarker. There are, of course, ways you could improve neuro, uh, improve ALS and not have an effect on neurofilament. So not every drug is going to affect neurofilament. But if neurofilament is lowered, I think that that's a very good sign. And this drug helps us understand that. That's the first point. The second point, perhaps even more positive for someone like me who's been focused on developing therapies for ALS for uh, more than 20 years now, is, well... I think this teaches us, if you look at the later time points, and if you see what I see in the later time points, I think this teaches us that ALS is treatable. As long as we have the right drug, something that really works, uh, we'll see an effect on the, on the disease process. We'll see a disease-modifying therapy. Whether any of the drugs out there now are really disease-modifying therapy is up to some discussion, but they're, they're not showing improvements where we see in this uh, study improvements. And if we find the right drug, I think that ALS is treatable. And, and that's a really important concept um, for me. And I think an important concept for the ALS community that um, it, again, if we find the right drug, that we can substantially slow down the disease. And those are, that's the end of my presentation uh, today. For more information about what we're doing here at Washington University in St. Louis, I invite you to take a look at the uh, ALS Center website. Also look at our um, uh, Miller Lab website, which has a wide range of um, basic science and other studies that, that, that we're doing in the lab. And I look forward to, um, to discussing this further with you. Thank you. Excellent, Timothy. Thank you so much for that. It was a very, very exciting and very interesting information you shared with us. So, yeah, of course, uh, uh, there were, there were, and, and there still are many, many hopes on this compound. Uh, we have uh, an Argentine uh, participant of the, in the Torferson trial. He lives in in Florida, in the U.S., and he he always kept reporting us about how. Uh, how much he was improving and along with other comments from other participants around the world. So yeah, of course it was kind of disappointing when 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 we we received the news that the the, the clinical trial trial didn't meet the the primary endpoints. But um, uh, I I heard you at, at one um, at one conference one one WFN conference last year. Uh, by the end of last year, uh, mm -hmm. when you were, you know, uh, presenting the the results from from 2021, and and talking about uh, trying to figure out why why uh, the 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 trial didn't meet the the primary endpoint, mm -hmm. and it, it really looked to me and and I guess to some other people too that this was all a matter of numbers, right, or, or a matter of maybe study design, a matter of of, of time, uh, but. Uh, it didn't. It still looked that, like the 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 drug was was getting somewhere. It still looked like the drug was uh, it, at 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 a certain level. It was effective. So was that your your impression too? And it it, it is is still your your impression that that, that this drug uh, can 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 be a one a potential approved treatment for ALS. Yeah, I mean my um. In my opinion, at the later time points, you see a, a clear effect, a clinical benefit. And, you know, again, I acknowledge, and I did in this, uh, in this presentation, I continue to acknowledge that we didn't hit the primary endpoint, right? And so that, that is, as you point out, that's disappointing to not hit the primary endpoint and, and you know, have some challenges uh, along the regulatory path, et cetera. But when you look at it, I, but I think it just takes time. You know, the, the, the first the first point to make is it took eight weeks before SCD1 went down. So that's two months. So then we were looking for a clinical change within four months. And that just wasn't enough time. You start to see it at 28 weeks. I think you really see it out at 52. And the stabilization of function and the, and the improvements that we see 
um, uh, to me are um, are impressive. And so I again, you know, could we have run the study differently, perhaps? Um, but the data that we have in hand, you know, again in 2021, a little bit hard to see. You know, we did a in the January 2022 uh, data cut. Uh, I think made it more clear. So, with this new trial currently ongoing uh, and, and all the the changes that I guess you 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 have made, uh, do you think we we can get some positive news uh, probably next year or probably in twenty twenty four? Um, do you mean from uh, FDA? Yes. Yeah. Like, so the uh, the you know as you know is yeah. we're in the middle of the regulatory uh, uh, part. You know th this drug is what's known is that um, the FDA has announced that they <laughs> agreed to review the drug. They also announced recently the, the to extend the time that it's going to take to review. Um, I'm uh, uh, confident that. Um, that the FDA, you know, will review the drug and and um, and think very hard about this. It's it's hard to um, for me to make any predictions or any comments about the about the regulatory path at this point, and I have to defer you to my colleagues at Biogen um, uh, for that. But I I do think that that they're slated to make a decision in um, 2023. Would be my guess. So next year we should get some kind of news, whether we, we will have not. news. We we will have news um, mm -hmm. in 2023. That's good. That's good. Okay, uh, Timothy, uh, what else can you tell us about your your ongoing research? I mean, other clinical trials uh, in which you are involved. Well, we're involved in the. Um, a variety of um, clinical trials and and studies here uh, at Washington University. Um, you know, they're they're I guess they would say that they're ongoing. I mean, you know, the one exciting study for us is the Healy platform study. Um, exciting because of the drugs coming in, and exciting um, because of the way that that's being done, which is to um, you know, the, the ability to, to identify a drug that should be tested in ALS and then move it quickly into the platform, test a drug, test another new drug, test another new drug is something that I think is innovative uh, in the ALS world. It's been done in cancer and, and, and other parts of medicine, but is innovative and has um, met the challenge of getting in drugs quickly. Now, a number of those, as you also know, some of the first ones through uh, we're not positive in terms of their readouts. Um, but I think the one of the ways to do this is to get a number of drugs through. The only way to, to you know, there's a lot of drugs that have very good rationale and it makes sense to to try in the setting of ALS, but we need to get them through and we need to get them uh, um, tested. So that's, you know, one, we continue on with a number of other, um, a number of other trials uh, at, at at WashU, and then we continue on in my group um, doing basic research, trying to come up with new um, new ways to understand ALS, new ways to, to treat ALS. And we use a whole variety of, um, we use you know, human cells and, uh, and uh, models of disease, um, bioinformatics, all sorts of different approaches to try to come up with new pathways and, and new ways to treat the disease. And I'm I could talk about some of those, if, you know, if you'd like, or talk about other um, research studies. But again, there, there's a lot going on in the ALS world. We're excited about it. And there are a ton of new drugs that are coming through. Um, and that's super exciting. Again, based on the data I just showed you, if we get the right drug, we could have a substantial effect on ALS. And so... Do we have we defined that yet? No, not one that I'm, you know, convinced has really changed the course of ALS. Not that there are there are drugs out there that are approved that are good and um, great. They can change somewhat, but I want to see a drug that can make people better. 
you know, show improvements in strength, shut the process down, shut down neurofilament, you know, make uh, stabilized breathing, increase strength. That's the kind of thing that we're looking for. Yeah, and in your presentation, you just mentioned that at a certain point, although we still need to be very cautious about this, at a certain point, uh, the Traversan trial did show some improvement, not only stabilization, but also improvement. That, I, and yes, that is really exciting for anyone affected by this disease. Yes, I, I'd agree. I mean, I think if you look at the, again, at the later time points, in particular, um, in those that initially started on Tofersen, you see, as a group, some improvements. And when you mentioned that this trial uh, or this compound may may have some benefit for uh, other people that are that are not uh, carrying this this particular gene, uh, you you mean specifically about you're talking specifically about the person or you're talking about the, the specific technique of uh, uh, oligonucleotide yeah. science? Well, but there's, I mean, I, did, I didn't highlight that and should have the, the, the first point about the technique. There are other antisense oligonucleotide trials. SOD1 was the first in man study and, and one that a number of groups have learned from, including the spinal muscular atrophy and others. There's a, been a C9 targeted uh, antisense oligo trial. There's an ataxin 2 antisense oligo trial, and um, one's coming through to also target uh, Staphin 2. And I also should mention that there's a FUS trial. So <clears throat> the FUS, you know, uh, um, the FUS genes are targeting. So all of those things are, are, um, are coming through using the same exact technique and showing that it's safe and effective in one group makes it um, uh, helps with the path to use that kind of therapy in another group. And so that's another <clears throat> benefit of the SOD1 ASO trial that I actually didn't highlight. So I, I thank you for bringing back up. The other, your other question about, and this is, this is often asked, SOD1 itself has been implicated in sporadic ALS. There's a lot of controversy surrounding uh, those findings. Um, maybe controversy is too strong of a word, but some groups would argue that OCD1 is involved and in more broadly in ALS, and others would say, no, it clearly is not. I, I think right now um, there are not plans to treat uh, non SOD1 ALS with Tofersen. I think we need more, we would need more evidence before we move to, to that kind of trial. And so I'm not going <clears> to <throat> say that it, that it won't be done or can't be done or shouldn't be done, just that it's going to take more time. I see. And... <laughs> I mean, the, the other trial to mention is the ATLAS trial, um, which is uh, treating, uh, following people who are asymptomatic, you know, gene carriers, SOD1 gene carriers. <clears throat> and, and then um, um, following them over time to see whether they have a, a change and then getting them onto a drug as soon as possible. Yeah, I remember one of the questions uh, we we made to you last year in your previous presentation for the for our association in Argentina. Uh, uh, it, it was about well whether you recommend gene testing for every patient or even gene testing for for family members. You know, it's always a, a hot topic. It, it looks like we should all well maybe not all but all patients should be tested at least for SOD1 considering the 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 you know the 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 advancements of 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 the of these clinical trials uh, it looks like uh, uh, it should be part of the standard of care that patients should be tested for at least the most prominent uh, uh, gene mutations uh, the, wouldn't you agree so I would agree that genetic testing is is part of standard of care. We offer genetic testing in uh, every patient with ALS or every you know, person living with ALS in, in our clinic. Um, so yes, we offer it. It needs to be offered with some genetic counseling. So we need to have people understand that we might get back a variant that we don't understand, that we don't understand. It has implications for the family. I mean, so there are, there, um, we need to discuss genetic testing with people before doing the genetic testing, is my opinion. 
Um, testing people who are asymptomatic, though, is a much different game. That's much harder to consider. Not, maybe not harder to consider, but it comes with a, a larger amount of genetic counseling. Comes, you know, with implications for um, well, a wide variety of things, and you know, not just insurance, but people's mental health and um, you know, families, etc. So there's um, asymptomatic genetic testing needs to be done carefully and thoughtfully, and whether that becomes standard of care, meaning you need to know because you could get on a therapy, you know, is, is something to consider. Um, in the future, I think we're not there yet. I do think that genetic testing in uh, people living with ALS should be routinely offered, but that's a, an opinion. Because it looks like it makes more sense now that we may have treatments to offer at least for SLD1 or maybe for another genes, because some years ago, maybe you didn't know what to do with that information, right? If you, if you, if you received the news that you had, that you were carrying a specific gene, you, you didn't really know what to do with that, right? Yes. But, but now it, it, it's, it's starting to make more sense, right? Yes. I mean, again, um, it depends on how you view the data I just presented, but it, it is worth noting that there is an expanded access program for Tofersen. So for somebody with SOD1 related ALS now, there's not a clinical trial. There's an expanded access program. So someone if someone who has SOD1 related ALS, they could get on Tofersen. So it's I think that's important to, to share with people as well. And that's perhaps to your point of the genetic testing and that there's a and for some of the genes, SOD1, there's an action item on the other end. For FOS, if you discovered FOS, there's a clinical trial ongoing for FOS right now. You can get in that. If you, exp if you discovered an intermediate expansion for ataxin 2, you know, it might be a good idea to be a part of the ataxin 2 study. You might want to be a part of that even without the, the intermediate expansion, but that would be a reason to at least seek out that study. Um, right now, uh, the C9 trials, um, focus trials have been, uh, for ASOs have been put on hold uh, because that there was a readout and those were not positive, I think as you and, and others will know. Um, so anyway, and, but then there are perhaps other reasons to know. I mean, see, if you have a gene in, that has implications for the family, some genes has, has implications for uh, watching for frontal temporal dementia because there's an association with frontal temporal dementia. So I would, again, in our clinic, we uh, routinely offer genetic testing for those reasons, though, again, needs to be discussed, not taken lightly. It, you know, it should, people need to, to think about the implications. And there are some people that we discuss it with who say, no, I don't want to get genetic testing for one reason or another. Mainly, um, most, most of the time it's been related to family concerns. Kind of the implications it'll have for the family. Of course, of course. Uh, and now in 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 the world of ALS, we just got a, a third drug, a third approved yes. drug. So, what are your thoughts on that? Now we have AMX 0035. So uh, we have Rilusol, Edaravone, and AMX. What what are your thoughts on that? I guess you have positive thoughts, but if you want to expound on that, yeah. Um... Well, so, uh, you know, first I, I've uh, been involved with the Northeast ALS Consortium Clinical Trials Group and, um, you know, who were uh, a major part of, of that study and the development of that uh, and that whole program. So very satisfying to, to see that move all the way forward and to and to, to look at not me, but my colleagues in the, the Northeast ALS Consortium uh, involved in that study, perhaps as a a disclaimer: I am a part of the study and and you know uh, author on the the papers about the work, so I'm not a, a 100% unbiased or non-biased viewer. I'm I'm a I'm a part of that work and have been uh, involved in it. But I'd say you know the the top level thing to say is it's good news for the ALS community, right? I think the 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 
the effect that you see, and again, in their, the parent trial was small, but there, met the primary endpoint. And if you look at the survival data in particular, that's what I'm struck by. I look at the survival data. I say, well, okay, so you know, maybe I don't have a degree in statistics and it's hard to dig into this and you know try to understand some of that. There are criticisms of the study. But when I just look at the survival data, you know, people living five to six months longer who were treated with a drug, that's good news. The other thing to look at is looks safe to me. Yes, there are adverse events, there's adverse events in all studies, and there are some, you know, perhaps GI unpleasant uh, adverse events, but nothing that looks particularly dangerous. And so when I, when I look at those data, I say, wow, we've got the um, survival benefit um, coupled with relatively uh, um, low toxicity or, you know, low adverse effects. I think that's good news. And I'm going to follow the FDA lead on this, approved in the United States for people in, um, in that I follow, people living with ALS that I follow, and they want to start on this drug, I'm going to offer it to them. I'll, I'll say that, you know, there, there are some uh, controversies, challenges uh, surrounding the, the drug, but I think mostly what we need is a readout of the phase three. You know, I want to see the phase three data. And it's a large trial and it's being done in Europe and in the United States. And that those data will influence kind of what I do going forward, right? But for now, good news. Um, I'm going to offer it. I'm going to follow the FDA lead. Um, and pleased to see for the FDA community. The, the last point I'll make is that um, I actually think we can do a lot better. It's good that it that it's approved. It's good that it works, and it's good that we're going to give it to people. And I'm happy to to uh, have an opportunity to make people a little better, right? But I think we can do even better. Like I think this is this is the beginning of of drugs coming through, you know. And I think I I can now see um, with with the Tofersen experience that we have the right drug. Things get a lot better, so I guess that that'd be the other perspective that I the, that I would have. And saying that we can do better is not knocking the the Livrio or the the Amelix drug. Just saying, wow, uh, there's a lot of stuff coming through that I'm excited about. We very recently had a a talk with uh, Dr. Matthew Kiernan from from Sydney, and uh, we were talking about platform trials. And of course, he, he he does agree with you that platform trials are a, a, a fantastic way to accelerate development. But he he did mention that they were ex they are expensive. They tend to be really expensive. So then I asked him if, if maybe they are expensive at the beginning, but they maybe they end up being not that expensive in the long run because you can you know study four or five drugs at the same time. So. Uh, what do you think we, we, we need to, to, to get more platform trials? Because it, it, it does seem to be the way to accelerate things. So I'm not sure about the finances of the, of the platform trial. You know, that's not my, that's not <clears throat> been part of what, you know, what I've done. Of course, the Healy platform got a um, generous donation and start from, uh, from Sean Healy to, to, to MGH. And, starting it up and developing it, I'm sure it was expensive because there was a lot of work that went into it. I think once you get it going, my sense, and again, this is not, uh, uh, um, without, this is, this is without much information, you know, without real data to, I don't think it's any more expensive. I would say that once it gets going, my guess is it would be less expensive because you don't spend a lot of time figuring out what's going to be the, Read out. How are we going to do this study? And then the other thing that a platform helps with is um, enrolling people more quickly. Often you, because you're, you have a whole system set up and a whole, you know, so you can get going quickly. So you decide you're going to do the drug. There's, you know, there's not the contracts and all the other long lead times. And in the clinical trials world, my understanding is time is money because you're, you're paying people to run that study. And so if you can get something going quickly. My guess is that the finances are on the favor of putting your drug into the platform. That doesn't mean it's inexpensive. And also acknowledging that getting it going 
in any you know uh, any place probably has extra costs because you have to figure the whole thing out. We also talked uh, with uh, Dr. Kiernan about uh, about biomarkers. He 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 does a lot of work in in in, in that field. Uh, but uh, what do you think of this? It 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 looks like it's still something that needs to be more developed. Like neurofilaments look promising, but it, it looks like uh, we need more. Uh, what what do you think about biomarkers and 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 the current state of biomarkers research in ALS? Yeah. Well, again, there's a lot of exciting things coming through, and and a number of people focused on a whole variety of mar markers. So I'm um enthusiastic about a lot of the stuff that I see in the biomarkers world. We'd like to have something that's more motor neuron um, or uh, specific or ALS specific, right? So neurofilament is, you know, not uh, ALS specific. So that would be good. We'd, you know, like to have something that we know is responsive to a whole variety of mechanisms uh, in the setting of ALS. Um, so I think we just need more again, coming back to the study that I just showed you, more positive trials are what's going to feed our de our development of biomarkers. It's hard to know whether, you know, your drug just was, it was marginally effective or didn't have much of an effect or the biomarker didn't move, right? So we need more studies where we see a movement of neurofilament. Well, can we find something even better? Can we see something that moves fast, you know, even more? Can we make correlations between changes in neurofilament and changes in outcome? Can we predict from the start who's going to respond, who's not going to respond? There's all sorts of ways that we could make improvements. It's easier to do that within the, the setting of a, uh, of a trial um, that is successful. And then the other comment I'll make about biomarkers, I've been really talking about generic biomarkers that show um, response to therapy. One of the most important biomarkers in my mind to, that needs to be introduced and still remains challenging for a lot of studies is something that shows that the drug works. So how will we know that a drug is doing what it's supposed to do? It's a very simple sort of question. SOD1 lowering ASO lowers SOD1. Gee, that doesn't sound like a very brilliant idea, Dr. Miller. Hmm. But we need to do that in every single trial that we can. Or, and, and in other words, if you look back at the long history of ALS trials, sometimes it's hard to tell whether the drug that didn't work actually did what it was intended to do. Did it move that thing in that pathway that the drug was targeting? And for some drugs that have been developed, for example, there's not a good marker of the drug activity that we can measure or follow. And that um, that makes it challenging, um, especially when the trial is negative. So we need more of those. Excellent. Okay, uh, we are going to thank you again for sharing this presentation with us, for, for taking part of your very valuable time to, to you know, give, give us this presentation for our ALS community in Argentina for the second time, the same yes. as last year. It is is really good to to see you again, and it, and it's really good that, that we still have many hopes on Tofersen and uh, and other trials, and also on on ASO in general. So yes. we we're gonna keep crossing our fingers for next year. Uh, yes. Hopefully, hopefully we 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 may we, we we may have another approved drug. Let's 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 keep our fingers crossed. So if you want to share any final comments or salutations for our community, just, just go ahead. Um, uh, delighted to to be here and to be able to um, to have this discussion with you. I do hope to visit uh, Argentina at some point uh, in person, you know, rather than uh, 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 by Zoom. I understand it's an absolutely beautiful country, um, so I I do hope to visit it at, at some point. But again, thank you for the invitation and delighted to have this discussion with you. Thank you again, Dr. Miller. Thank you for this presentation and we will stay in touch and hopefully uh, we, we're, gonna, we're going to organize another talk uh, uh, pro probably soon, probably next year, okay? Okay, okay. thank you. Take care. Yes, this, were re this was very helpful for our patients and families in Argentina and also in, in the rest of the Spanish-speaking countries. So thanks again, Dr. Miller. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye. Take care.
Bye-bye.